Subhan, Mandi, Atni, Nia. It's really great to be back in Sri Lanka uh, and to have a chance to attend the 10th International Research Conference. I think it's a real great honor, uh, and uh, I thank you for the invitation. Uh, I spoke at the 8th IRC, as the Honorable Chair just mentioned, and it was a wonderful experience. I found it to be uh, an important forum and a great learning experience, not only for me, but uh, the exchange of ideas that were freely expressed uh, meant a lot to me. I also, during that time, got to uh, uh, enjoy the cultural tour to uh, Kandi. It was the time of the uh, Parahara, and, um, uh, and uh, I'd just uh, like to say that I really appreciate Sri Lanka's rich culture and vibrant history. Uh, and in that vein, uh, I also want to thank the student dancers uh, that uh, did the presentation this morning. If you'd have told me they were students, uh, I wouldn't have believed it, and I thought they did a great job. So uh, I was asked to uh, talk about the changing dynamics in the maritime domain with a special emphasis on the Indian Ocean. Uh, let me see here. Uh, it's a rich topic and uh, one that I've uh, uh, thought a lot about. Uh, I'm a big fan of Robert Kaplan uh, and his masterpiece of a book, uh, Monsoon, uh, which focuses on the Indian Ocean and how global power uh, is shifting in the 21st century. Uh, Monsoon had a big influence on me when I read it back in 2010. Uh, and when we were writing the U.S. Navy strategy in 2014, we decided to use the term Indo-Asia Pacific uh, rather than what was then the more commonly accepted term uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, we use this uh, lexicon because we recognize the reintegration process that was underway among East Asia, Central Asia, uh, South Asia, and the Middle East. Uh, we thought that widening the aperture to the expanded scope of the Indo-Asia Pacific would counter any negative perceptions with the uh, pivot that we were shifting our focus away from Southwest Asia in favor of East Asia. And I personally felt that uh, it allowed us to view China in the larger context of Asia, uh, rather than overly focusing on what was going on in the South and East China Seas. The Indo-Asia Pacific region remains the most dynamic region in the world. The center of gravity for economic activity and trade has shifted east of Suez. I was reading in Parag Khanna's excellent book, Connectography, uh, that in the 1970s, transatlantic trade represented 80% of global trade. By 2013, it was only 40%. The trade nexus between East Asia, uh, South, Af South Asia, uh, Africa, and the Middle East now makes up a significant portion of global trade. Accordingly, the sea lines of communications that run across the Pacific and Indian Oceans are the economic lifeline of the world. Globalization rests on the free flow of international maritime trade. 90% of world trade by volume travels across the oceans, and about 70% of the world's population uh, lives within 100 nautical miles of the coastline. Plus, the sheer vastness of the Indian and Pacific Oceans point to the need for all of us to work together, be it for maritime security, economic security, or human security. It is just too big a job for any one country to do. No country is too big that they can't use help, and no country is too small that they can't make a valuable contribution. We also must collectively ensure that this vital region remains open and inclusive while respecting established rules and norms in the maritime domain. So when I was asked to talk about some of the changing dynamics in the maritime domain, uh, and in the interest of time, I'm going to abbreviate a little bit of what uh, I was going to talk about. But I, I focused on three areas. First being the traditional and non-traditional maritime security threats that I see that are increasing. The second being the evolving military challenges uh, that to include Indo, I mean, uh, anti-access in the Indo-Asia Pacific. And the third piece I wanted to talk about a little bit was this, the new Silk Roads and infrastructure provision that's ongoing in the Indian Ocean region. So let's look at the uh, maritime security challenges first. Uh, to give you some idea of the scope of the problem and just how big the ocean area is, it's over 8,000 nautical miles from Shanghai to the Gulf of Suez. From the Gulf of Suez to Colombo, Sri Lanka, it's about 3,700 miles. If you look at this slide, you'll also see that the same region comprises some of the most strategic maritime passages or navigational choke points in the world. These include the Strait of Malacca, the Strait of Hormuz, the Bab el Mandeb, the Sunda, and the Lombok. If you look at the same map and you were to uh, display shipping route density, you would see how much shipping traffic converges 
at these strategic passages and what a disruption to the flow of these merchant ships would cause to the global economy. With the globalization phenomenon and the need of the large Asian economies for imported uh, energy, you can only see that these trends will continue. This is also the region, in terms of natural disasters, uh, that's probably the most dangerous in the world. We're all familiar with the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, Cyclone Nargis in 2008, uh, the tsunami and nuclear crisis in uh, Japan in 2011, Typhoon Hainan in the uh, Philippines in 2013, and more closer to home, Cyclone Mora, which just a few months ago caused devastating floods, landslides, and tragic loss of life uh, and displacement of over 400,000 Sri Lankan people. I've had personal experience in dealing with some of these uh, from the Pentagon and some of these from at sea. Uh, sadly, these weather events will only become more frequent in the future. It is, is it now time to uh, set up some coalition or mechanism to more quickly respond to these events in this region? I think it's a conversation that we need to have. These are seasonal events and could very readily have a seasonal ready response force. In terms of maritime security, we also have to remember that this is the region that saw the Mumbai terror attacks of 2611, which came via the sea and commandeered uh, fishing vessel, as well as the uh, Tamil Tigers and the uh, seaborne terrorism that uh, uh, Sri Lanka faced. This region continues to deal with the risk of piracy and armed attack at sea. Uh, while incidents of piracy are down off the east coast of Africa, armed attacks have actually risen in the Bay of Bengal and Malacca. Uh, to be sure, there's been a lot of good progress uh, uh, in this uh, region with the formation of organizations like the Regional Cooperation Agreement on Combating Armed Robbery and Piracy Recap, and also the standing up the Infusion, Information Fusion Center in uh, Singapore. Great examples of the region working together, but there's uh, still more to be done to solve these hard problems. We also have the issue of illegal and unreported and unregulated fishing, which becomes a matter of both livelihood and security. And with overfishing, pollution, and mismanagement of ocean resources, this could become a major issue of food security in the future. Uh, I haven't even addressed the migrant uh, and refugee issues, which uh, we also have to deal with. Uh, you guys have all seen uh, what's going on in other parts of the, uh, of the world right now. But if you overlay all these uh, on a, uh, in terms of maritime security, you see how complicated uh, the problem could become. For all these reasons, it's so important that we work together in these interagency and multilateral fora that, uh, to promote peace and prosperity that so many of the uh, uh, speakers have already addressed earlier today. Uh, the second area I'd like to talk about with respect to uh, the changing dynamics in the maritime domain uh, are the evolving naval and military challenges. There is a strong push for naval modernization among the countries of the Indo-Asia Pacific. I see three drivers of naval modernization in the region to be, uh, first, the competing and potentially conflicting maritime interests. Uh, access to resources is a good example there. Uh, I see it as a response to modernization or expansion uh, by potential uh, competitors or in response to specific uh, security challenges that the countries themselves think they face. So essentially there's a maritime arms race ongoing in the Indo-Asia Pacific. Some countries are focused on anti-access weapons and strategies. This is a serious problem as access is a precondition for monitoring the health and safety of the maritime domain and for ensuring freedom of navigation, for building and sustaining relationships of the countries sharing the global maritime commons. The other concerning trend that I see is the proliferation of submarines in the region. All the major countries in the region are increasing or modernizing their submarine capacity. Additionally, new countries are seeking to enter the uh, submarine game. Uh, these include Malaysia and Thailand as well as Singapore. So one way to think about the naval modernization uh, uh, is that it's taking place in a region in terms of uh, I, I would I'd call it either stabilizing or destabilizing uh, capability development. I see many capabilities such as maritime domain awareness, environmental monitoring, law enforcement, maritime command and control, coastal patrol, and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. These capabilities are generally uh, stabilizing. Conversely, there are other capabilities that are much more potentially destabilizing in the future. All of this has implications for what capabilities countries should pursue. And remember, our ultimate goal should be to protect the global commons, respect the rule of law, and preserve the peace, and respect individuals, nations, sovereignty. The third phenomenon I see uh, that uh, in terms of the maritime domain and the Indian Ocean region uh, is this acceleration co in competition in terms of physical connectivity and connecting Asia. By this I'm referring to port infrastructure, new road and rail networks, and economic 
and security infrastructure that's um, in provision across the region. Physical connectivity and infrastructure are manifestations of overall economic development, which can be collaborative or competitive, or both at the same time. This infrastructure play that is occurring in the Indian Ocean region could have significant strategic consequences. Infrastructure investment, economic development, and increased connectivity are generally good for everyone. However, economic growth combined with population growth and rising expectations increase the potential for competition of resources for markets and for regional influence. This has the potential to lead to actual confrontation. It's an exciting time to watch as the uh, Silk Roads and Spice Routes are returning. Uh, China's planned Belt and Road Initiative, uh, which se seeks to link through infrastructure provision economies across Eurasia and East Africa is a perfect example of this. So new supply chains are being created, and the question is whether they will be inclusive or exclusive, and uh, what cost uh, participants will be asked to pay, uh, IG in terms of uh, influence, etc. So those are the three broad issues I wanted to uh, talk about, and uh, I'll be ready for your questions when that time comes. I just want to real quickly just say, uh, since I was here two years ago, I wanted to shift gears and talk about all the positive developments that I saw in the uh, last couple of years with the U.S. Navy and uh, Sri Lanka Navy and also with our, our two governments and uh, militaries. I think the relations are at an all-time high, and I just want to take a couple minutes just to say that. Um, I was really excited to see the uh, visit of the Blue Ridge, the U.S. 7th Fleet's command ship, uh, to Colombo in March uh, of 2016 and uh, hosted the uh, Sri Lankan president, uh, Sirisena. Uh, and this paved the way for several more high-profile port visits. Uh, the Somerset uh, came on board with a bunch of Marines and they did a lot of theater security cooperation and humanitarian assistance and disaster relief training. Uh, and uh, Sri Lanka also sent uh, two observers to our RIMPAC uh, exercise, the Rim of the Pacific exercise. It's the world's largest maritime exercise and it was the first time in Sri Lanka has uh, participated, and I thought that was a great, uh, great addition. And also, we restored the uh, military training I met uh, uh, in the past year. So uh, this is only going to deepen the ties between our two militaries in the future. Uh, these are just a few examples of how far we've come uh, in, in terms of our, this vitally important and strategic relationship. Uh, this is a long-term commitment, and we look forward to the future and, and what will become many significant uh, security contributions uh, to the Indian Ocean region from Sri Lanka. And that's all I had. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions.